Welcome back. I'm glad you've joined us for this series titled Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. I'm Mark Finley, the host of the series, and we've been on a journey, a journey through the book of Revelation, but particularly looking at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12. In these verses, God presents his last day message for mankind. He pictures that message as being carried by three angels in midheaven. In our last presentation, we looked at Revelation 14, verse 6. We saw that the everlasting gospel, the gospel of God's grace and goodness, was to go to the ends of the earth. We saw as well that God has a plan for us, a plan to participate with him, to cooperate with him in taking the message of his love, grace, and truth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And that, of course, begins with our own families, with our own neighborhood, with the workplaces where we work, with our communities, in our schools. In Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. When many people think of the judgment, they begin to become quite frightened about their lives appearing before God in judgment. In this presentation, we're going to focus especially on the good news of the judgment. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that we need not fear that eternal judgment, that in Christ we can have confidence that you are our judge, our attorney, and that you will vindicate us in these last days of verse history, that in Christ we have nothing to fear. So as we study about the judgment in Revelation, help us to have that sense of your standing by our side, but teach us too that we're responsible for the choices that we make. In Christ's name, amen. The title of this presentation is Jesus and the Judgment, Why the Judgment is Good News and Not Bad News. Now, you may not have thought about it that way before. You may have thought about the judgment and trembled at its thought. That's legitimate. The judgment is a very serious issue. In fact, some time ago, Daniel Webster, who was one of America's best-known statesmen and orators, was asked, what is the most solemn thought that has ever passed your mind? And Webster responded, the sense of my individual responsibility to God. You and I were created as free moral agents. We were created with the capacity of choice, of the opportunity to make decisions based on the faculties of conscience, of reason, and of judgment. And the judgment in, of God in eternity is based on how we have responded to his grace in the choices that we ourselves have made. Daniel Webster said this, this thought, that is the thought of the judgment, is not pleasant to those who are living in their sins and out of relationship to him and consequently are not prepared to face the tremendous issues involved. But whether the issues are faced or not, catch this now, the fact remains. So, quoting Romans 14, 12, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We are all responsible to God as the word of God declares and cannot escape our responsibility. You and I are created to make positive choices. The Holy Spirit impresses our heart to enable us to make those choices. God arranges circumstances in our lives so that we can make the best possible choices. But the judgment has to do with the decisions we've made in life. Did you catch what Webster quoted in Romans 14, verse 12? So every one of us, not a few of us, not one or two of us, but every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That is part of our destiny. One day we'll appear before the judgment par of God. Choices are the stuff that life is made of. And our choices will determine our eternal destiny. What kind of choices are you making today? What kind of choices have you made this last week? What kind of choices have you made this last month, this last year? Are your choices guided by a spirit-directed conscience? Are your choices in life subject to the principles of God's word? Are your subjects guided and shaped by the teachings 
of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 adds, For we must all, again, notice the universality of this, just like in Romans 14, 12, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, either good or bad. So in the final judgment bar of God, the issues in that judgment bar are how have our choices been made? What choices have we actually made that either will lead us to eternal life or eternal damnation? Now someone says, but wait a minute in life, is it our good deeds are weighed against our bad deeds? Let me explain it this way. When God created us, he created, of course, Adam and Eve with free, as free moral agents. Throughout life, since Adam and Eve's fall, the devil, the serpent, the evil one, has been leading men and women to make poor choices. He's been leading us to make choices that lead us away from God. Jesus, on the other hand, appeals to us with hands outstretched to come to him. He appeals to us to make eternal decisions guided by his spirit, decisions that are based and, f and founded in his very word. There's no question that according to the Bible, we're accountable to God. There's no question that we are responsible for our actions. You know, some people say, well, it's my genetics that has done this. You know, I'm predisposed to act this way. My father got angry, so I get angry. My mother lost her patience. She wasn't a patient person, they say, so I at times lose my patience. Somebody says, well, you know, I have obesity in my family. It's in my genes. Other people say, well, you know, I, I can avoid anything except smoking because my father was a chain smoker. He was an alcoholic. You see, all kind of excuses can be made, but the truth of the matter is, although we may have genetic predispositions to something, we do not turn on those genes. This is called epigenetics. We don't turn on those genes until we make choices to indulge those inclinations. So we are responsible for our actions. Now, there's no question at all based on the Bible, that the decisions we make are going to determine our eternal destiny. Now, there are a number of facts about the judgment we're going to study. This judgment that's outlined in the book of Revelation. Remember Revelation 14, 7, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. We're going to study that very clearly. The first thing we notice about the judgment is that in the judgment, Jesus is our judge. Now that surprises some people because they have the idea that the Father is the eternal judge. That is true in a sense, but notice what the Bible says. John 5, verse 22, For the Father judges how many? The Father judges what? No one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So based on Jesus' own statement in John 5, verse 22, Jesus is our judge in this final judgment. In the judgment, not only is Jesus our judge, but he's our defense attorney. You <laughs> say, that, that's kind of confusing, isn't it? Let's look at it. 1 John 5, verse 22. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate, that's an attorney, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So Jesus is our judge. Jesus is our advocate. You say, that's a conflict of interest. It really is. <laughs> but aren't you thankful? that Jesus takes upon himself that conflict as our judge and our, our defense attorney. Let's suppose that we're going to court. And let's suppose that I have gotten a speeding ticket. Hopefully, as a pastor, I haven't gotten that speeding ticket. Let's suppose I did. Let's suppose I'm going 70 miles an hour in a 40-mile-an-hour zone because I'm rushing to get some, to some meeting. And the uh, officer stops me, and he says, now, you, you are going 70 miles an hour in a 40-mile-an-hour zone. Uh, that's going to be a fine. And so let's say, hey, wait a minute. I was rushing to the hospital to see somebody dying. I'm going to fight this in court. And so I go to court, and I stand up. And I look there, and that's my brother, who's the judge. And um, I, I'm uh, astounded. Now, I don't have a brother. This is an illustration. So let's suppose that's my brother, who's a judge. And I'm astounded, and I, I, that's good news. And then let's suppose my 
he gets off the bench and he says, I'm going to be your defense attorney as well. So my brother is my judge. My brother's my defense attorney. I think that's a pretty good opportunity for me that I'm not going to pay that expensive fine. What do you think? Jesus, our elder brother, is our judge. And before the judgment bar of God, our elder brother says to us, these wounded hands were for you. This, the thorns that pierced my brow were for you. The guilt and shame and condemnation I bore on the cross was for you. I am your judge, but I'm also your attorney. And before the universe, before thousands and ten thousands of times being, I will present your name and I will say, this man is one of mine. This woman is one of mine in Christ. Because he is our judge and our attorney, we need not fear. But if we do not have Christ, if Christ doesn't fill our hearts, we tremble in the judgment as our lives are exposed before the universe. Now, Revelation's last day judgment, in the book of Revelation, it presents it very clearly that there is a judgment. These three angels fly in the midst of heaven. They announce to the whole world, no more business as usual, no more pleasures as usual, no more life as usual. We're living in a critical time of this earth's history. Remember what we read and have been studying in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a what kind of voice? What kind of voice? A what? A loud voice. Why? So the whole world will hear, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Do you notice the expression, for the hour of his judgment? This is not simply the hour of our judgment. It is the hour of God's judgment. What does that mean? The devil has claimed that God is unfair and unjust, and that he's not worthy to rule the universe. And the eternal judgment that takes place in heaven, the hour of God's judgment, it will be revealed before a waiting world in a watching universe that God has done everything he could to save us, that there was not one more thing he could have done, and God will be proved righteous, God will be proved just, God will be proved as the one worthy to, be, to rule throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Jesus' life and Jesus' death revealed his character of unselfish love. In the judgment, it will be shown conclusively that this Christ that lived the perfect life that we should have lived, that died the death we should have died, that was resurrected, this Christ has done everything possible to save us. There was not one more thing he could have done. Now, the judgment reveals God's justice and mercy. The law demands that those who break that law suffer eternal death. God's justice could not have let the human race go on without paying the penalty of a broken law. If God would have done that, it would have created chaos in the entire universe. And so God has to deal justly with the sin problem. But God's mercy would not allow him to destroy the creatures that he created. And so justice and mercy blend together at the cross of Calvary, determining for us, when Jesus determines for us to bear our, the guilt and shame of our sins, that enables us to stand free before the universe as our judge Jesus and as our advocate Jesus presents our case before the entire universe. In the final judgment, the entire universe will see the countless times that God has reached out in loving ways to save us. In the final judgment, before the whole universe, the record books of heaven will be opened. And it will be shown that God sent angels to beat back the forces of Satan in our life. It'll be shown before the universe, recorded in those books of heaven, that at the times of our deepest temptation, at times we're about ready to be discouraged and couldn't go on another step, that God was sending his angels there to beat back the forces of hell, to bring light into the darkness of our lives, to give us encouragement, hope, and inspiration just when we needed it. 
It'll be shown in those books of record that God arranged the providences in our life, that God brought people into our life to lead us closer to him. It'll be shown that he revealed himself in the natural world. Every sunrise and sunset reveals his love. The gentle falling rain that causes the crops to grow reveal his love. The stars twinkling in the sky reveal the very, very love of God. The earth that spins on its axis and orderly makes its way around the sun reveals the precision, the accuracy, and the love of God. You see, in the judgment, it will be shown that there's nothing that God could have done that he hasn't done to save us. But most of all, it will be shown that Jesus left the glories of heaven, left the worship of the angels, left the worship of the seraphim and seraphim, and Jesus plunged into the snake pit of this world, this morally defiled, this sex-centered, thrill-jaded generation, this crime-riddled, polluted world. Christ came here and he tabernacled in human flesh. And as he did, he lived the life we should have lived so that we need not die the death that he died. The judgment reveals all of that. He gave us opportunity after opportunity to respond to his loving appeals. He sent his Holy Spirit to our hearts again and again and again. The hour of God's judgment has come. Satan has claimed God is unfair. Satan has claimed God is unjust. Satan has claimed that God doesn't care for us. Satan has claimed that God is a vindictive judge, that all he wants is selfish worship from his creatures. In the judgment, it's revealed that his love is magnificent, that there's no lengths, no depths, no heights that it would not have gone to to redeem us. That's why the whole universe in Revelation 6 and 7 sings, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. At the end of that judgment, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he indeed is Lord. At the cross, we find the intersection of justice and mercy. And in the judgment, we find that it's not good deeds weighed against bad deeds. It's rather, have we accepted the living Christ into our lives? Now, the Bible says, Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Sin has a wage, and that wage or that price is death. But the Bible also says, Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If we have come to Christ, if he fills our hearts with his grace, if we are charmed by his love, if our lives are committed to him, we need not fear the judgment. Now, how do works play their part in the judgment? We talked about choices early on and the importance of positive choices. It is not love Christ and simply do whatever you want to do. When you love Christ, you do what he wants you to do. That's why Jesus said in John 8, verse 29, I do always those things that please him, that please the Father. That's why it says in Hebrews 10, 7 and onward, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O God. That's why in Gethsemane, when the world trembled in the balance, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 and 36 to 39, the Bible says, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. So when we come to Christ and we are truly changed by Christ, when by faith we grasp his righteousness, when his grace changes us, we long to do his will, not to earn our salvation, but because he has saved us. Apple trees produce apples, not in order to become apple trees, but because they are apple trees. Christians produce good works, not to prove they are Christians, but the good works are the spontaneous result of a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Now notice Revelation 20, verse 12, the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. What else could the dead be judged by? You, what else could they be judged by? Our works are the external manifestation of our faith. Now notice how it's put in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So in the judgment, it's not our good works. 
It's not because we have, stri we have had this striving for salvation and we've gone through this painful torture to do good works. It's rather because Jesus Christ has come into our lives and changed our lives that Christ has made us over again. And that's why the Bible says it's not of works lest anyone should boast, but look what it says next. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we are saved totally, only, completely by grace. But that grace leads us to obedience. And the obedient lives that we live are the spontaneous result of being saved and transformed by his grace. Our good works, empowered by the Holy Spirit, do not save us. But they do testify that our faith is genuine. The external manifestation of our works presented in the judgment, recorded in the books, based on our choices, demonstrate that our faith is indeed genuine. Did you ever read this story? It's rather an amusing story of one of these wizards who is able to do about anything. I don't mean some kind of mag magician, but I mean one of these guys who does strange, odd feats. He strung, can you believe this? True story. He strung a wire across Niagara Falls. And he walked on that wire across the falls. Now, people had died trying to go through on a barrel across the falls. They had died in other ways trying to do this tightrope. But he strung this tightrope wire across the falls, Niagara Falls. And he walked on that tightrope, you know, ever so gently across the falls. And he did it two or three times. And people gathered to see this man. And they were yelling and screaming and applauding. And he said, how many of you, after you had done it three or four times, how many of you think I can do it again? They raised their hand. How many of you think I could do it with a wheelbarrow? They said, oh, we know you could. So he wheelbarrowed the thing across, wheelbarrowed it back. How many of you think I could do it with somebody in it? They raised their hand. Yes, yes. How many want to get in it? Not one person stepped forth to get in that wheelbarrow. Did they really have faith? Did they really believe? See, if you believe, if Christ changes your heart and you grasp by faith, that is manifest in your choices. It's manifest in your actions. Our good works, what do we say? empowered by the Spirit, because they're not good works we do in and of ourselves. They don't save us, but they testify that the inner faith is genuine. Our inner faith is revealed in our outer works. Now, there's something else about the judgment. According to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, the judgment has arrived. It's a present tense judgment. The hour of God's judgment, what does Revelation 14 say? Has come. Now, you say, what does that mean, the hour of God's judgment has come? It means that before the coming of Jesus, there is a judgment in the courts of heaven to determine who will be ready when he comes. If, according to Revelation chapter, 14, chapter 22, verse 12, if Jesus is coming to give out his rewards, there must be a judgment previous to his coming to determine who receives what rewards when he comes. And so the judgment has arrived. It's a present tense judgment. In other words, the destinies of the entire human race, all of those who have died in ages past, are currently being settled in the judgment bar of God. Revelation 14, 7. Fear God, that is respect and give glory to him. We're going to study about that in our next presentation. For the hour of God's judgment not will come, but has come. When Jesus spoke about the judgment in his day, in Matthew 12, verse 36 and 7, he says, every idle word that men speak, they will give account of in the day of judgment. It was future. Throughout the Gospels, the judgment is always something future. But when you come to Revelation, it predicts that just before the coming of Jesus, the clock will strike the hour and there'll be an end time judgment. We'll in fact study in a next presentation as well, the timing, when did that judgment begin? What is the significance to you and me that we're living in this judgment hour? Now, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, then he'll reward each according to his works. Again, Revelation 22, verse 11 and 12, 
Matthew 16, verse 27, when Christ comes, he comes to give out the rewards. So there must be a judgment previous to his coming before the whole universe so they can see God's wisdom, his love, his justice, so they can see those men and women that have responded to that love whose faith has led them through the power of the Holy Spirit to live in harmony with his will. They will receive that reward of righteousness, that reward of eternal salvation when he comes. Again, Revelation 22:12. 12, again, throughout the Bible, behold, I'm coming quickly. I believe he's coming is soon that the signs of the times indicate that he's coming rapidly, soon, quickly. My reward is where? With me to give who? Everyone according to his work. So again, the judgment takes place before his coming. Could we be living in the judgment hour now? Is time running out? We're going to study the exact time period of when that judgment began. We're going to sense from the scripture, the prophecies of Daniel, the exactly the time the clock struck the hour. Revelation's prophecies, my friends, are being fulfilled. We are living in critical times of earth's history. The sands and the hourglass of time are running out. This is a time to open our hearts. This is a time to make a full, complete, absolute commitment to Jesus Christ. If the hour of God's judgment has come, when did this judgment begin? We're going to study that, and this is why it's so critically important not to miss one of these presentations. Invite your friends to watch these DVDs. Invite your friends to watch these telecasts because we're going to be identifying exactly when that judgment hour began. The books of Daniel and Revelation are companion books. The book of Revelation is explained in the book of Daniel and the book of Daniel is explained in Revelation. Both of them are prophetic books of prophetic visions. The book of Daniel provides a foundation for the book of Revelation. One can never fully understand Revelation and the message of the three angels unless you first understand the book of Daniel. So let's go back and study this judgment scene from Revelation 14, 7 in the book of Daniel itself. There's a magnificent scene in heaven in the book of Daniel. Now in Daniel chapter 7, you have the rise and fall and the destiny of the nations. There in chapter 7, nations rise and fall. These nations want to usurp the very kingdom of God. Babylon rises and falls. Daniel says, I watched as these nations were rising and falls. You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. You have the breakup of the Roman Empire, all these nations. And Daniel says, I look beyond the rise and fall of these nations. I look beyond the conflict of nations on earth. I watched, Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, till thrones were put in place. The thrones are movable thrones. The thrones put in place. The Ancient of Days. Who's that? The Ancient of Days. God the Father, right? Was seated. His garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head like pure will. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued before him. A thousand thousands ministered him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were open. Do you get the sense of this? Here is an intergalactic meeting. Here is a universal meeting of thousand times ten thousand. Every heavenly being is there. Cherubim and seraphim are there. Angelic beings are there. We have the whole host of heaven crowding in in the courtroom of God. The destinies of the human race are to be settled. But even beyond that, God's name is to be cleared. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ demonstrated his love and the name of God was vindicated before the universe. But the question is, is God fair in dealing with every human being? Has God truly given everybody the opportunity to be saved? In the final judgment before the universe, it'll be revealed the justice of God. I want you to catch the majesty of this moment. I want you to catch the solemnity of this moment, the significance of this moment. Let your mind dwell on it. Thousands times thousands of beings gather around the throne of God. They are there 
to see God's name honored and exalted before the entire universe. The destiny of all humanity is decided in heaven's courtroom. But more than that, God is dealing with the great controversy between good and evil in a way so that sin will never rise up a second time. Once we see how bad sin is, how evil sin is, how wicked sin is, and once we see how good God is, we will never want to go back to the cesspool of sin again. Daniel says, Daniel 7, 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who's that Jesus? What does he do? He comes with the clouds of heaven. Who does he come to? He comes to the Father. Father and Son meet together. And there in the courtroom of the universe, in the most holy place, the inner sanctum of the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus presents his blood. He presents his sacrifice before the whole universe. And he says... I am the savior of mankind and those that have accepted me, they in me, through me, because of me, they are accepted in the beloved and they have right to enter into heaven. He came to the ancient of days, they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. What happens in the judgment? Christ in the judgment, did you catch it? Did you catch it? Don't miss it. Then to him was given what? Dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. So in the kingdom of God, in the courtroom of the universe, in the inner sanctum of heaven's sanctuary, Jesus steps forth and he is presented with the kingdom. His sacrifice is enough. His righteousness is enough. His grace is enough. And the whole universe sings to the glory of his name. He is given the kingdom. The judgment shows that Christ is the rightful ruler of the kingdom. Daniel 7 verse 14, his dominion is a what? Everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Now the judgment also reveals the saving righteousness of Christ and his triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. The judgment reveals that Christ will be honored, exalted in the universe, and that all the powers of hell will be ultimately destroyed. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 says, After these things I looked. Daniel 7 shows us the judgment. Revelation 14 shows us it. And also there is this vision in heaven that John has of the judgment. We get some added insights here. When you study the Bible, you have to compare text with text. You get a little bit here and a little bit there and you put it together. Revelation 4.1, after these things, John says, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. There's a door open in heaven for you, my friend. Whatever experiences you're having in life, However you feel oppressed, discouraged, disappointed, there's a door open in heaven. And what does God say? After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. God says, come, look through the open door. You'll get new courage, new hope, new inspiration. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I'll show you things which must take place after this. Here, the voice from heaven says, come up here. Come up here into the throne room of the universe. Come up here into the judgment bar of God. Now, when John looks there through that open door in heaven, in Revelation chapter 4, what does he see? This is a magnificent scene. Revelation, the fourth chapter. And I want you to see it as I read it from Scripture. Revelation chapter 4, after these things I looked and a door is open in heaven. Whoever you are tonight, there's a door open in heaven for you. Whatever you're experiencing tonight, there's a door open in heaven for you. God invites you as he invited John, come up higher. Take another step. By faith, see what Christ is doing in your behalf. In the light of the judgment hour, see this Jesus who stands for you in the judgment. S gather round the throne room of the universe. Notice what it says. It says, and he who sat on the throne, verse 3, was like a, there was a sardius stone in appearance. It was a rainbow around the throne. The rainbow indicates judgment and mercy. God put a rainbow in the sky after the destruction of the world by the flood, indicating the world would never be destroyed by a flood again. Notice, around the throne were four and twenty thrones, and on the thrones were twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white robes. They had crowns of gold upon their head. Who are these twenty-four elders that sit on the throne. The Bible says they were redeemed from the earth. 
in ancient Israel, there were 24 courses in the Levitical priesthood. Those priests represented Israel. So the 24 elders are those who have been redeemed from the earth, resurrected at the time of Christ's death and resurrection. Remember the Bible says when Christ died, the graves were open. After his resurrection, there were those that came out. Who are these 24 elders? They are men just like you, just like me. These are people around the throne of God that God has brought up there to his throne. Why are they there? To represent us before the throne of God. You know, the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We too are priests and kings of God. And those 24 elders that are there represent us at God's throne. And if they are there, if they made it, we can make it too. They stand with Jesus around God's throne. Notice what the Bible also says. It says that these 24 elders that represent all the redeemed that one day will rejoice around the throne of God, it says that they come from earth. They face temptation. They face trial. They face difficulty. But they are there. If they made it, we can make it. Now, the Bible also says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, it says that there are four creatures around the throne of God. It's a little strange theme. It says these four creatures are like a lion, like a calf, like a man, like an eagle. What about these four creatures? What do we learn from the history of Israel about them? Israel marched in the wilderness under four banners, a lion, a calf, the face of a man, and a flying eagle. These were the banners that Israel marched under. These banners symbolized God's continual protection, his everlasting guidance, and illustrated the roles that Jesus would play in the deliverance and the bondage of sin. Now think of it. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion. He becomes a sacrifice or a calf, an animal of sacrifice for us. He tabernacles in human flesh as a man, the face of a man. But after his death, he flies again to heaven as a soaring eagle. So what do these represent? Just as these banners represented God's everlasting guidance, and just as they em emphasize his protection, so likewise, these four creatures around the throne of God represent the total ministry of Christ for us. The one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, our king, the divine Christ. The one who became a man to sacrifice his life in our behalf. And the one that was resurrected from the dead. As we look into the judgment bar of God, there are the elders that are there. They represent all humanity. They represent all the redeemed. There are there the four Creatures representing the living Christ there before the throne of God. Jesus stands for you and me. And we can come from all points of the compass, the north, the south, the east, and the west, whoever we are, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to gather at that throne through faith in Christ, knowing that Jesus indeed is our Savior. That's why at the end of Revelation 4.11 it says, You are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. This is what the judgment is about. It's about the honor of Christ. It's about the glory of Christ. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We exist by the will of God. We were brought into existence by God's will. We were created by a loving Christ and redeemed by a loving Christ, and one day we will be ushered into eternity by that loving Christ. Now in Revelation chapter 5, it builds on Revelation 4. In Revelation chapter 5, John sees the scene. There is a being with a scroll. The scroll is sealed with seven seals. John asks the question, who can open the scroll? John senses that this is the scroll of judgment. He senses that if nobody can open that scroll, the sins of humanity are there. He watches. As Jesus comes forth, first John is weeping because it appears nobody can open the scroll. But then Jesus steps forth and Jesus is worthy to open the scroll. The question is asked, Revelation 5, verse 2, who is worthy? The answer, Revelation 5, 3, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. Nobody in heaven, nobody on earth could open it, except who? Except Jesus. No angel 
could ensure your salvation. No cherubim or seraphim could ensure your salvation. No being on earth could ensure your salvation, but there is one who can in the judgment, Jesus, the living Christ. John says, I looked, Revelation 5, verse 5 and 6, I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. There before the judgment bar of God is the picture of a slain lamb, the living Christ who has died for you and for me, having seven horns, horns are a symbol of power, seven eyes are a symbol of wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to the earth. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll. And I looked and behold a lamb as it had been slain. Here is the incredible good news before the judgment bar of God. The authority of all heaven, before all of that authority of heaven, Jesus steps forth. He is given the kingdom. Salvation is given to his people. Why? Because Christ has provided ransom. All have sinned, Romans 3.23, and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, as we've read, but the gift of God is eternal life. We need not fear it, the judgment. Some time ago, it was a fascinating story that took place in New York City. There was a judge who was known to be very kind and very compassionate. And as this judge was trying a particular case, a man came in before him. And the man was tried because he was a thief. He was arrested as a thief. He had gone into a bakery and he had stolen eight or ten loaves of bread. And as he was leaving with the bread, the police had apprehended him because the, bake, the, the owner of the bakery had pressed the alarm, the priest came, uh, the, the, the police came, and they arrested this man. He was brought to court, and when he was brought before the judge, the judge said to him, you stole that bread. I did. Do you confess to stealing it? I do. Do you, do you de deem that you're guilty? I do. And the judge said, I have a question for you. Why did you steal the bread? And the man said this, I have a wife and I have four children. I tried to get a job, but I have not been able to get a job. I've been out of work for months. My money has run out. My kids were starving. So I therefore went down to find out where I could possibly get them some food. And in a weakened moment, I went into the bakery and stole that bread. The judge looked at him and he said, you're guilty. And what I'm going to do is charge you a $50 fine. But he said, look, any man in my city that has to steal bread to feed his children, he said, I am taking off my judge's cloak right now. And I am coming down by your side to pay the $50 on your behalf. And I want to invite you and your wife and your family to my home to eat with me tonight. Jesus says to you, and Jesus says to me, I'm stepping out of the judgment seat. I'm coming by your side. I'm putting my arm around you. I'm paying the price for you. And I want to invite you home. I want to invite you home. There's, Jesus wants more than anything else to have you at home with him. And that's what the universe sees. That's what the universe sees in the judgment. This amazing manifestation of the love of God. And that's why the universe sings, worthy, worthy is the lamb. They have seen a manifestation of his love on the cross. They have seen his intent in the judgment to save every human being. They've seen the ways that he has wooed human hearts the judgment of God is incredibly good news for the people of God because eventually it speaks of the end of the reign of sin. It speaks of the deliverance of God's people. Daniel and Revelation describe powers that rise. They describe Babylon that rises, but it does not rain forever, it falls. Medo Persia rises, but it does not rain forever, it falls. Greece rises, but it does not rain forever, it falls. Rome rises, but it does not rain forever, it falls. The kingdoms of this man of this world rise. There is a power that rises that unites church and state. 
Rome is divided. And out of Rome, there's this power that rises in Daniel 7. It's called the little horn with eyes like the eyes of a man. We're going to study that in this series to understand the whole issues of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. But here's the point. Political kingdoms rise. A religious political kingdom rises. But then Daniel's eyes are taken away from earth. They're pointed to heaven. John in Revelation points us to heaven. It says, beyond what is, there will be the eternal kingdom of God. All the universe one day will worship Christ and live with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Through the ceaseless ages of eternity, Christ's kingdom will never come to an end. In the judgment, the whole universe will see the glory, the magnificence, the beauty of the plan of salvation. They will say, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Daniel 7, says, the kingdoms of earth reign until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in what? In favor of the saints of God. Christ will step forth. Judgment is made in favor of the saints of God. One night, Martin Luther was sleeping. And as he was sleeping, he had this terrible dream. He dreamed that the devil came to him and he dreamed that there was a scroll in the devil's hand and the devil unrolled the scroll and he saw this hideous evil angel and he saw a list of all his sins and it was the judgment and it was before the judgment bar of God and in Luther's dream he said, those are my sins and the devil said, are they your sins? Yes, they are. Are you guilty of everyone? Yes, I am. Does, is the wages of sin death? Yes, it is. Do you deserve to die eternally? Yes. And the devil said, you're condemned. But then Luther saw the devil's hand on top of that scroll. And he said, in the name of Christ, move your hand. The devil said, no, in the name of Christ, move your hand. The devil moved his hand and said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses Martin Luther from all his sins. In the judgment, not good deeds against bad deeds. Our deeds reflect our faith. Our deeds are important because they reflect whether or not we've made a full commitment to Christ. In the judgment, Jesus wants to step forth for you. In the judgment, Jesus says that he wants to make judgment in favor of the saints. In the judgment, all evil powers will be destroyed. In the judgment, all wicked powers will crumble. In the judgment, Christ will be exalted as Lord of all. Daniel 7, verse 27, Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall obey and serve Him. In the judgment, the Father gives to the Son the kingdom, and you and I participate as the royal line in that kingdom. We become princes and princesses and sit on thrones with Christ and worship with Him through the ceaseless ages of all eternity. Would it not be foolish? Would it not be foolish. I was thinking of another word, but that's the only word I can think of. A foolish. Wouldn't it be a foolish choice to turn your back on that love of Christ, to turn your back on that invitation to be with him in heaven? Wouldn't it be foolish to make choices for the tawdry pleasures of this world when Jesus offers us eternity? When we can sit on a throne with him, when we can worship with him, we can travel from star to star and planet to planet and see the vast technology of civilizations that have never fallen by sin and be his honor convoy sharing with the universe the depths of his love and the glory of his grace. In highest praise, we will fall at his feet and worship him through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Jesus will stand for us in that judgment. We with the angels in the redeemed of all ages, Revelation 5, verse 9, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe. What was that message of Revelation 14, verse 6? I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Here it is. Now those that have accepted that message those that have responded to this message of the three angels, those who have understood these three cosmic messages at, in earth's last hour. It says, you've redeemed us, they sing, by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign on earth. 
We are kings and priests of God. Do not throw away your heritage. Do not turn your back on a love that is appealing to you many years ago. There was a farmer who visited London for the very, very first time. He had never been to London before, and he was awed by things like the London Bridge, awed by things like Big Ben and the Parliament. One day he had a little time, so he decided that he would go to one of London's famous art galleries. This farmer was a Christian, and as he was walking through the art gallery, he came to a picture. It was a picture of Christ hanging on the cross. He stood there. I was gripped by that picture, overwhelmed again by the thought of Jesus with nails through his hands, blood running down his wrists, with the crown of thorns upon his head, bearing the sin and the guilt of all humanity. And as this man stood there, 15 minutes went by, 20 minutes went by, Soon there were tears that were running down his face. And all he said was, all he could say was, Oh, how I love him. Oh, how I love him. Somebody standing by heard the old man and stood by his side and looked at the picture and said, I love him too. And somebody else stood by his side and said, I love him too. Pretty soon there were a group of people there, arms around one another riveted to that picture they made a decision in their life i'd rather have jesus than silver or gold i'd rather have jesus than riches untold in the judgment you need not fear christ reaches out to you right now deep within your heart as charles sings would you like to say i'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than a houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a past domain or be in sin's dread sway, I would rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I would rather have Jesus than men applaud. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have a Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have a chief than anything this world affords me today. Yes, he's fairer 
than lilies of rarest bloom. He is sweeter than honey out of a comb. He is all that my hunger in spirit need. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus This world of Will you open your heart to pray with me right now? Father in heaven, we've heard the appeal of the song, and deep within our hearts we respond that we would rather have Jesus. Help us each day to make those eternal decisions, decisions prompted and guided by your Spirit. Enable us today, deep within our hearts, to say, I would rather have Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.